Hi everyone, Rachel here. Welcome to this brand new episode of the Ditch the Diet podcast. So I hope you've been enjoying the No Diet December little mini series that's been running over the course of this week and will be running throughout December but I would like to break those little bonus episodes up with a full length episode today. So if you are a brand new listener to the Ditch the Diet podcast, this podcast is for anyone out there who has or is struggling with long-term effects of yo-yo dieting and you would like to take a better, more diet-free approach to your health and your weight loss journey if that is your goal. I designed Ditch the Diet and the podcast for anyone out there who has ever struggled with their weight and struggled with being either on the wagon or off the wagon and would like to just completely throw the wagon out of the window all together. So if that is you and you would like to learn how to quit dieting then you're in the right place. Welcome, it's lovely to have you here and if you are a long-term listener then thank you very much for coming back. If you haven't yet had the opportunity to leave a review for the podcast then I'm just going to remind you and ask you again before you go today just to scroll down on Apple Podcasts hit the five star review button and if you don't mind writing a couple of sentences about um how amazing the podcast is <laughs> I really appreciate it it helps to get the podcast out to more people so that more people can benefit from listening as well so in today's episode I am speaking for the second time to Sharu Izadi now who is a behaviour change specialist and specialises in helping people with addictions as well as now specialising in helping people to lose weight without going on a diet. Shuru is very much aligned with what we do here at Ditch the Diet when it comes to focusing um, changes based around our long-term habits. And um, Shuru has written two books. One is called The Kindness Method. And we spoke about that in the previous episode that we did together back in March of this year. I'll link to that episode in the show notes. If you haven't listened to it yet, please go ahead and do that. And she has just finished writing and um, it is now available to pre-order her latest book called The Last Diet, where she talks about her own journey to um, losing weight permanently after undergoing a lot of yo-yo dieting herself and the techniques that she goes ahead and uses now with people in, on a private basis in her clinic um, and via her website and via her books. So it was absolutely brilliant getting to speak to Sharu again and it's a perfect time of year to be talking about this when we're being constantly bombarded with diet culture via the social media, the television, everywhere, magazines telling us that we're not good enough, that we should lose weight, this, that, the next thing. Um, so hopefully um, this interview will encourage you to read Shuru's book and make it the last diet you will ever Let's do it. go um, on. So I'd like to welcome Shuru Izadi back to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming back uh, to talk to us about your new book today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so before we get started, I thought it would be a good idea just for those of our listeners who haven't actually listened to our previous episode together um, to get a bit of an idea of who you are, um, how you spend your time, what do you do? So could you tell me a little bit about yourself, first of all? With pleasure, yeah. I'm a behavioural change specialist and I help people to change their habits, regardless of what area of their life it's in. Um, I help them to understand why they're not able to implement the plans that are most important to them um, and give them a bit of insight into how best to create a path of least resistance for themselves to make changes. And how long have you been doing that for? Um, I started working in behavioural change, I suppose, when I, was, uh, when I started working in addiction, and that was about 
seven or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I was working with people who were addicted to all sorts of different substances. And mm -hmm. I learned a lot of the, the approaches there around motivation and self-esteem and self-awareness. And for the last two years or so, I've been working more, more closely in a coaching capacity to help people with more day-to-day -day habits that are inspired by what I learned originally. Okay. okay. And um, so your, your first book was called The Kindness Method. Um, shall we have a quick chat about that first of all, about what, what sort of inspired you to write that book? And then we can talk about your, your latest one as well. Yeah, totally. I am... Um... I had changed my own eating habits using a lot of the approaches that I was that I was learning were working in addiction treatment to motivate people to change habits because I realized that they were applicable uh, to so many different life areas and I had spent a large proportion of my life trying to understand why I couldn't lose unwanted weight, why diets didn't work, um, beating myself up about it and having really negative body image and placing so much of my value on what I weighed and whether I was being good or bad that day with my food choices. Mm -hmm. And I realized that the more compassionate, curious approach that uh, was working in addiction was starting to rub off on me. And I was using these approaches on my eating habits and and starting to change them more easily than I ever had before. So... Um, a few years ago, I was contacted by a journalist who said that she wanted to change her drinking habits but not stop drinking altogether. And I thought, well, I haven't ever helped anyone to do this. Usually I help people to stop drinking. But then mm -hmm. I thought, well, if we take the way that I've changed my relationship with food for an, as an example, um, I have to eat all day. And if we mm -hmm. pretend, for example, that someone you know wants to continue to drink and has to navigate this, um, could I apply the same thinking there? Could I try and help her to gain insight into the sorts of drinking behaviors that she is happy with and the ones that she wants to change and to notice the distinction between enjoyment and abuse? Um, and she managed to, to, to change her habits and she wrote an article and off the back of that I was contacted about writing a book and the kindness method I'm glad to report since we last spoke because when it had just come out has done incredibly yeah. well. Um, yeah, it got translated into five languages and I get contacted a lot by people and I can't help but notice that a large proportion of those people um, are people for whom the the story of never quite understanding before why they couldn't change their eating behaviors um, really resonated. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. I think for me as well, um, I, I speak quite openly about like my history with um, food issues um, diet related problems and inability to sort of get a hold on that and for me I think reading the kindness method was quite a made quite a big difference in my life at the time I think it was March wasn't it uh, March we last spoke um, so when I saw that you were write, writing a book specifically about um, dieting I was really excited to read it um, so was it was it more was it more sort of that you'd had a lot of comments that that book had helped people to change their relationship with food that made you want to want to write a book that was dedicated to that type of uh, experience for people then truth be told i signed a two book deal initially mm -hmm. and it was always going to be the case that um well not always actually but it became more and more apparent from the feedback of the kindness method and also the way that i wrote the kindness method really that the second book was going to be about weight loss Mm -hmm. um, and was going to provide people with an opportunity to understand using the same kinds of approaches why they were finding it difficult to lose weight or keep it off or get started or find a sustainable and enjoyable way to manage a weight that they were happy with long term that also meant that they had built their self-esteem and it wasn't that sort of surface white knuckling approach that I used to take that always left me more disillusioned and invariably heavier mm -hmm. um, in the end. So yeah. Uh, you talk about your weight the in your book, the your way of eating, your ways of eating and your personal story of, you know, dieting, disordered eating patterns and things like that. So could you tell could you tell me a bit about your sort of personal background with dieting, losing weight? Because you've written this book not just as a professional but also from personal experience as well, which I think is 
quite important too because you know what it feels like to actually have gone through a lifelong struggle mm. with you know losing weight gaining weight dieting not dieting yeah I mean I spent as I say I grew up quite conscious of of my weight for various reasons it was brought to my attention at school etc and in the media that the fact that I was over, an overweight child was not a good thing mm -hmm. and I began very early to try and find ways to lose weight some of them um, absolutely you know I'm not a medical professional by any means but they were unhealthy it's safe to say and so I started along this pattern of assuming that some foods were bad and some foods were good and depending on which diet I'd adopted that all got confused mm -hmm. um, and there were lots of conflicting opinions and so I would wake up every day and quite and it just got more and more intense how much I wanted to lose weight and how it became very much um, the biggest priority in my life and kind of remained like that throughout all of my decisions you know decisions that had nothing to do with weight really like, am I going to go on holiday? Am I going to date? Am I going to wear this? Um, mm -hmm. I had begun to associate with being slim or not in, um, in order to kind of Im imagine myself being able to enjoy those those things very early on. And so I would argue I've there are very few diets that I didn't try out from the very sensible end of the scale to the very, um, very extreme end. What was, what, what, did you have like a sort of pivotal moment or a light bulb moment where you realised that dieting was not working for you anymore? Was there one specific moment or what was it that made you sort of throw your hands up in the air, so to speak, and say enough is enough? I think there were a few. One of them was certainly that at one stage I lost so much weight and was so much slimmer than I am now and I was wildly applauded for it. Mm -hmm. And I'd be lying if I said that people weren't, the response I was getting wasn't positive. But I knew that I hadn't built in self-esteem. Patches of my hair were falling out. I felt crap. And frankly, it was going to be unsustainable because I was hungry all the time. And I was having to isolate myself to remain looking that way. And I just felt awful. And I realized this hasn't actually got to the core of anything. I haven't solved anything. Mm -hmm. um, and... The other one was actually a few years, it's 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 really difficult, and I, I know a lot of your listeners will relate to this, where, where you've lost and gained weight so many times that you don't even remember which episode you're, um, you're referring to at this stage. <laughs> yeah. um, at one point I was in counseling, and the counselor said to me, what if you never lose weight? And that really, really, really annoyed me, because it occurred to me that I I had put my life on hold presuming that I would do all the things that I thought a slim person could do when I had lost weight. And I left that session really angry and then I sort of entertained it a little bit and I imagined the things that I planned to do when I'd lost weight and I started doing them. Mm -hmm. And that enabled me to lose weight far more quickly because I realized that being kinder to myself across every possible area of my life made it much easier for kinder eating habits to fit in and mm -hmm. for me to want to be more active and apply more common sense principles that I would want someone that I cared about to apply to their bodies. Mm, absolutely and I think uh, at this time of year I don't know if you've noticed <laughs> I don't know whether you you block out the noise now automatically but my personal news feeds are absolutely crammed with um, I don't really want to use a collective word people but personal trainers, brands telling me that I need to lose weight otherwise I won't be good enough for other people, for myself um, and it really, although I feel like I've got a bit of a hard shell round about me nowadays and these things kind of bounce off me, I know for a lot of people that listen to the podcast um, are probably experiencing probably worse than I am actually and um, being bombarded with all of this at the moment um, and I mean what do you think is the biggest problem right now when it comes to all of these different things because they're not going to go away so how do you know how does someone navigate this really difficult time of the year sort of December January um, without you know you know and not to try and avoid those feelings of 
really like low self-esteem when we're basically being told from every angle that we're not good enough by the media. <laughs> it's interesting you say that and I think it's important for us to acknowledge how we curate our social media feeds in that sense because mm -hmm. I for the most part am not getting that stuff if I'm perfectly honest yeah. and yeah. although I know it's there don't get me wrong um, I know it exists and I've seen it I try to actively find ways of avoiding it coming into my consciousness and I and I also um, I also make sure that I follow people who are positive about their bodies and mm -hmm are not goal oriented when it comes to learning about how about nutrition and how to generally make them feel better and people who focus on how exercise and food choices can benefit their mental health mm -hmm. as opposed to just their physical size mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah um can we talk about your the the sort of the way that your book is laid out um, so if you were to give a, a brief summary of what someone can learn from reading The Last Diet, what would it be? It would be to learn why it is that previous attempts haven't worked. Mm -hmm. Give yourself some compassion and forgiveness and understanding when when it comes to that. And also to shine a light on how you want to be eating when you've lost weight, not mm -hmm. in order to lose weight. And I think focusing on that makes you kind of zoom out and think about what's important to you, like being able to socialize, being able to make spontaneous decisions about food, being able to make food choices with joy and have a kind conversation with yourself afterwards. And also to be able to catch out any of those um, all or nothing thinking patterns that often come from dieting. A lot mm -hmm. of people think, oh, I've, you know, I've blown it now, I've eaten this. And very often, in my experience certainly, and in the experience of a lot of my clients, it isn't the food choices we make on the spot that cause us to gain unwanted weight. It's the conversation we have with ourselves about them afterwards and the choice that we make subsequently. And I think that's, that's one of the most important themes that runs through all my work, is that ultimately, um, the choices we make come down to the conversations we have with ourselves and in my case the kind of the conversations the less I wanted to dull um, turn down the volume on, on them with the coping coping strategy which I used which was binge eating which invariably had the byproduct of having me gain unwanted weight for obvious reasons but in the first instance, it was about unlearning all that stuff about what's good and what's bad. And therefore, if you've ruined it and if you're on the wagon or off the wagon, and it was just exhausting. And what I wanted to, to do for people with The Last Diet was to help them to believe that by going through a process of understanding where your behaviors came from and why you're finding it difficult, you can create a life where you're not waking up wondering whether you're going to be good or bad and you're able to genuinely enjoy food for the joy that it is without letting each choice impact the next. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, that was, I think that was the main theme that I noticed about your book is that it's probably like the only book that I've read that is, you know, focusing on helping people to lose weight that very, very, only very briefly touches on what to eat and how to exercise. I think when you pick up a when you pick up a book that's about weight loss, normally you open it up and it gives you a set of rules to follow. Here's what you should eat. Here's what you should avoid. Here are the exercises that you should do. Here are the ones that are not good for you. And then you get you get on and you get in about it and you do it for a little while and and then you have to go back to the very beginning again and again and again and again. So that's what I find find refreshing about reading your because it sort of like gives you the tools, I suppose, rather than tells you what to do and I think you said that at the very beginning of the book is that's where a lot of a lot of that's why a lot of diets don't work or most diets don't work is that you're given a set of rules um so to speak and then um, would you agree with that <laughs> yeah I think that's what that's what I wanted you know the, the book is called the last diet but it's a bit of a trojan horse in that sense because it doesn't tell you mm -hmm. what to eat it doesn't tell you what yeah. to be it doesn't tell you what not to eat <laughs> It just allows you to um, have a framework 
from which you can implement any plan whilst in the meantime um, hopefully convincing you that whether or not you achieve your goals um, shouldn't be dictating whether or not you like yourself really mm -hmm. um, absolutely and, you know the other thing is we've never had more information at our disposal like I'm actually quite interested to know when people write diet books um, specifically what they're putting in there because I mean I haven't I haven't read one in years thankfully but um, yeah what what are you specifically putting in there because there's nothing that a that a quick Google couldn't uh, couldn't get us and I'm conscious that there are people out there looking for tools and that some of the approaches being offered to them especially when they're feeling desperate and vulnerable and desperately wanting to change are um, undeniably not not sustainable at the very least and not enjoyable and unhealthy I'm sure again I try not to throw around words like healthy because um, I don't profess to be a, nu a nutritionist or anything like that but I think there are certain things that we can all agree um, you know not having a varied diet having the sort of diet that leaves you that leaves you feeling bad <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah I'm not able to enjoy your life I know it sounds simple but and I laugh about it now because these just for some reason were never priorities of mine all I ever thought was I want to be slim and then I would get there and realize why am I not any happier and it's like well because the rest of my life has had to be compromised in so many ways and my quality of life has had to be compromised and of course this isn't going to be sustainable um, yeah. so yeah. That's, that's what I wanted to give people an opportunity to find a way of eating that suits them and so they don't have to adhere to these stringent rules that have been prescribed by someone who's never met them mm -hmm. oh, absolutely I think like as a as a previous dieter as well I was trying to sort of when I was reading through the book I was trying to read it as me in circa 2008 2009 10, 10 years ago or so um, and one of the thoughts and feelings that came up to me as I was reading through it was, okay, that sounds great, but I don't, like, I, I like rules. I, I'm used to certain rules. I like being told what to eat. And the thought of, the thought of actually creating my own plan and answering all the questions and, you know, writing down all the things in, in the notebook that you suggest to write down really start like would have scared me at the time I would have thought no 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 I can't I, there's no way I can trust myself I'm, I'm really scared that I'm going to go completely off the rails and and I'll just end up gaining weight is that something that you get do you experience that from people that maybe have read read your book and asked you about it yeah I mean I do give people the option there are some people who like guidelines in every area of their life and so I think it's mm. important to kind of remember that planning what you want to eat or not eat should also shouldn't be demonized mm. I do think though when you said there because I don't trust myself that's really mm. the bit that I'm that I'm focusing on mm -hmm. why don't you trust yourself mm -hmm. you know why why do you assume that you're an all or nothing person why do you assume that you're the kind of person who can't make decisions on the spot that are in your best interest that the same decisions you would make for a loved one and that's really what I think uh, is the is the crux of it that's that's what I want to help people with to feel empowered and that they can trust themselves not just with food but in area any area of their life where they where they feel there's a pull back to ways that they don't ultimately want to behave to feel um, that they believe in their capacity to do difficult things as opposed as opposed to try and create an environment where they're avoiding difficult things mm -hmm. absolutely and which brings me on to a question about the the section of your book called testing times which i thought was was absolutely brilliant because a lot of the questions that i get sent you know on a daily basis by email are things like i, w I want to do this but i've oh i don't know i've got this going on or that going on or life's really hectic and you know I can't start this now or I need to do this but this keeps getting in the way um so what sort of barriers are the barriers that you see most often when someone is you know embarking on a journey like this so life is always going to be hectic so I was going to throw us some some stuff to deal with um what were the main barriers that came up for you sort of in your recovery from dieting how did you approach them I found, first of all, that in those moments where I was most desperate to lose weight or to, to change my ways, I always assumed that I was going to sort of become a different person the next day. 
-hmm. and that desperation was going to be enough to motivate me. And I always underestimated that my motivation was going to waver throughout the day. So now what I do is I wake up in the morning and before I did this exercise just about food and now I just do it about everything and I just write, I spend five minutes in the morning just jotting down if I had to guess what would tempt me or make me want to behave in ways that I later regret either towards myself or other people. And then on the other side what I'm going to do when that happens and what that was really is an acknowledgement that there will be moments in the day where this goal is incredibly important and other moments where it doesn't matter at all. And the other thing I did too was I started imagining when I would make excuses. For example, um, it is it is difficult because sometimes if I want to exercise and I'm tired, it, I'm faced with a difficult dilemma. Is the kind decision to force myself to go or to give myself a break? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and and I and I have learned um, to do a couple of things. One of them is I almost pretend as if I'm justifying what I want to do to a person who I think is really clever and who cares about me and my long-term well-being. And I wonder whether they would buy it, if they buy the excuse. <laughs> and that has helped me enormously. And the other thing I, I try to think is, what would I want someone who I really care about, what decision would I want them to make right now? Bearing in mind someone I really care about, I you know I have their best interests at heart, and I want them to achieve their most valued goals. And I also want them to bear in mind that they're taking care of themselves, and this isn't be all end all. And so those kinds of questions help me to externalize what is going on and and gain some perspective and being be able to identify what a kind decision is for me. Mm. What would what advice would you give to someone that is um, going into sort of the new year thinking I need to go on a diet <laughs> what advice would you give to that person if you could um, stand in front of someone and give them give them some advice I'd say try to picture a life where you're already easily and comfortably and enjoyably managing your weight and imagine what it would need to look like, what you would need to have in place, not to lose weight, but to maintain lost weight. Mm -hmm. And then and be, and then realize that although your results may not be as quick or, you know, you're investing in a long-term turning down of volume in your head. I think that's the most important thing for me. And I know a lot of people relate to it is that it's not so much about the weight as it is about the obsession that you get with dieting. So mm -hmm. I would say, look at it as finding a long-term way of eating that you're happy with, be it, you know, at restaurants or snacking or whatever. Look at it as an experiment, as an exploration of things you like the taste of, options you have. And don't feel that you need to fit into a plan. Look at different things. Look at different plans. Look at different research. Look at different foods. And create a version of things that suits you and fits into the life that you want to have. And that's a great answer. Is it sustainable? Can you see yourself doing, you know, doing this in a year's time or three years' time, five years' time, forever? <laughs> um, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to cover, I meant to ask you earlier, but I haven't, um, was uh, you've just covered one of them was the fact that you know I'm thinking of myself ten years ago. I, w I would have wanted something that was going to give me results really, really quickly. So. The thought of doing something long term would have been quite scary, but then other another thing that I know would have probably come up for me, and I know it does come up from a, a lot of our members, listeners, is okay. So I know what I need to do now. I've got the book, I've read the book, I know what I need to do, but for some reason I just can't seem to get started or keep doing it or finding motivation or perhaps losing willpower is something that I used to hear myself say a lot especially the words motivation and willpower there what and uh, what capacity do motivation and willpower come into you know formulating this plan for yourself do they play a big role or uh, I don't tend to focus on that as much as I do getting uh, preparing for it to be difficult because it's a change mm-hmm and remembering that there are reasons at play as to why you could why you want to stay the same 
and acknowledging what those are. So for example, in my case, a lot of the behaviors that I engaged in were for comfort and to help me deal with stress and they were the only way that I knew and it wasn't until I shifted from focusing on what was wrong with my habits to actually what was right with them and what and how it and how they had served me that a when I was tested invariably because I'm changing this you know the status quo and that's and that's hard I could observe it with compassion and I expected it to be hard and so I could just focus on knowing that I was embarking on something difficult and I found that uh, very empowering Mm-hmm. And the other thing I was going to say, and also um, remembering that it was important that I was moving towards a more exciting life. It mm-hmm. wasn't enough to just lose weight. No. You know, a lot of people who are seasoned dieters know it's not enough. You need to feel better. You need to feel accomplished. You need to feel positive, and. Um, and for that, I think we need to be focusing far less on what's wrong with us and what's wrong with our habits and what we're moving away from and far more on what's right with us, what resources we have at our disposal, how our habits have been serving us so that we can gain insight into the other coping strategies that we can put in place, especially in the short term, when we're taking away this really important relationship we have and this really and our, our place of comfort. And I think it's hard when our place of comfort is on balance, resulting in negative impacts to acknowledge that it is, you know, our place of comfort. It's where we're comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Because I suppose when you push yourself, you know, into that uncomfortable stage, eventually that uncomfortable state will become comfortable for you and it will become like your new habits will not feel as difficult anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I know this is a really difficult question, to answer um it's almost like asking how long is a piece of string but i know that people will be wondering what uh, how long this sort of process can take so we know that um for example if you go on a 30 day sort of challenge it lasts for 30 days and we've got that sort of in our minds but a a change like this is a lot a lot more of a longer term approach so you know, how long can someone expect their habits to take to, you know, to feel like they're becoming more automatic? Is there a, can you put a number on that or is it individual? It it does depend on where you're starting. Mm. It really does. It depends. I would say it comes down to, it depends how kindly you're currently speaking to yourself and the conversation Mm. you're having with yourself and how prepared you are to listen in on that conversation, especially in those moments when things get difficult. The Mm. people who choose, you know, you have to choose to want to remember why you're doing something Yeah. in those, in those moments. And the people who embrace that, um, I, I'd say are the people who get the faster results. What I have, I have tried to do one thing in the book, which is appeal to the sort of reader I used, used to be, who did want to practically have tools to lose weight. Yeah. Um, and so I would say in that sense, uh, provided you're taking care of yourself, I don't want to patronize anyone by saying how quickly or slowly they should do anything with their bodies. What mm-hmm. I would say, though, is that alongside that, it's important that these personal development practices, the self-esteem practices are put in place. And that that is the harder work, but it's what will enable your results to last, regardless mm-hmm. of what, what route you go down and what you literally choose to eat or not eat. That I don't think is any of my business. And frankly, I think um, people will go looking for those kinds of things, whether or not I write a book. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. So what, you know, what kind of person is your book for? If you could describe the person um, that you wrote the book for. The person who's like me and that they became fed up of always having to do day one again. Mm-hmm. And the sort of person who spent Sunday nights planning the transformation that they were going to begin on Monday mornings and woke up every day deciding whether they're going to be good or bad and had all these stories that they were telling themselves about specific foods and felt that they didn't feel um, in control of their own behaviors around food. They didn't trust themselves around food and were used to binging and depriving themselves. And people who want to unlearn this stuff so that they can turn down the volume and make the same common sense decisions that they've always known make sense, the ones that they would apply to their children or anyone whose body they care about, and start asking themselves why they're not applying them 
to themselves and also to actively make a concerted effort to consecutively repeat new behaviors so that they can create a new autopilot for themselves like mm, I have yeah yeah it's amazing thank you so much for um for the chat today it's been great um when's your book come out boxing day boxing day fantastic and I guess you can pre-order it is that right at the moment yes, it's available for pre-order at the moment thank you very much I will put all the links to the book and to your website and things in the show notes um and yeah thank you again for your time today hope you have a lovely afternoon thank you thank you for inviting me that was great So in the lead up to Christmas and indeed the new year, hopefully this episode, in fact, I trust this episode has given you the little gentle nudge that you need to know that you don't have to go on a diet in January and you certainly don't have to restrict your food intake at all during December. If you would like to pre-order Shiru's book, The Last Diet, which by the way, I highly recommend that you do then please just jump onto Amazon, search and make the pre-order or you can just scroll down and have a look at the show notes where I have placed the link that you need to pre-order the book. Um, It's there, really simple and straightforward. And if you want to find out more about what Shuru does, I'll link to her website in the show notes as well. So thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Ditch the Right podcast. If you have enjoyed it and you think someone that you know might enjoy it as well, please feel free to share the episode with them. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube and everywhere you would normally listen to a podcast you will find the Ditch the Diet podcast. So please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. There will be lots of little mini bonus episodes throughout December to keep you going and keep you motivated. And then we'll be back with a brand new series in the new year as well. Thanks for listening. See you next week.